Good evening and good evening. Welcome to Saginaw Valley State University. On behalf of our president, Dr. George Grant, who could not be with us this evening, I bring you greetings from him. He wanted me to let you know that we are so proud and very grateful and very thankful that you are here on our campus and that you are here to participate in this wonderful lecture that we're gonna have this evening. Diversity brings strength for climate action. I also would like to take this opportunity um, to thank um, the Dean of the College of Science, Engineering, and Technology. I do believe that Andrew Chubbs is here. Andrew, um, if you could stand and wave. We appreciate and give him a net. Yes, thank you so much. This is, this is truly a team effort. And we also have our provost, Dr. Deborah Huntley, who's here this evening. Dr. Huntley, please stand. And, and in a few minutes, I'll tell you why it's important that we recognize these people. I do believe that our general counsel, Ellen Crane, also is here. Ellen, thank you very much. And then we also have members of the Stick Club. Some are here at Saginaw Valley and some are in the region. I want you to stand. I know you have your beautiful shirts on. And I, Pat, where's my shirt? But please stand, all of the Stick Club members that are part. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And we have so many other people who are here from the region, um, you know, to help us celebrate this great program that we're gonna have this evening. I also have to give special thanks to my new friend, Pat Race. Now, many of you know Pat, but I have had the privilege in the last several months to get to know Pat. And we survived, we survived. <laughs> Pat, where are you? This is the, yeah, this, uh, th this is what I would say, this is the brain behind this activity. This is the gentleman that made sure that I was on task. And he would send these emails to me morning, afternoon, evening, and what I appreciate about Pat is that his heart is in the right place. And he wants to do, yes, let's give him a nice tip. Thank you, Pat. So Pat is, uh, but before Pat, I just thought of someone else, sorry about that. We have the mayor of Saginaw here, Brenda Moore, please stand. We thank you so much. And this is the beauty of diversity. It brings us all together for a common cause. If you're in Bay City, if you're in Midland, if you're in Saginaw, Frankenmuth, or wherever you are, if you are young students, if you are senior citizens or, or uh, veterans, we welcome you here to Saginaw Valley State University. Now I'm gonna have Pat, if he would just, you know, give a, Few remarks, Pat, because we have a wonderful program plan. But but tell us how all of this kind of came together, and whatever thoughts that you would like to share with us. Pat Race, let's give it up. The first thing I like to do is have the people in the back row raise their hand if they can hear me. Okay, good. Now, there are two tasks that I have tonight, one of which is to go through the program. That'll take me about a minute and a half. And then the second is to set the context for what we're going to do. So you may have gotten this. You may not have paid too much attention to it. But just to let you know that when I am done speaking, Mary McCormick will introduce our first major speaker, Angela. And then when she, when he, she is done, then Andy 
another student from Saginaw Valley will introduce Bill McKibben. When Bill is done, we will then have a fireside chat where Emma Abedrebro, who is a, the leader of the um, Saginaw Valley Climate Stick Club, and I will interrogate Bill and Angela in a fireside chat. So my first task is done. And the second one, most people who know me think that I start every story with, I was born in September of, and I won't do that for you, OK? But will I, what I will do is, to organize my introduction, I have three quotes that I'm going to read. And then there will be perhaps seven sentences after that. And then Mary will come up here. So the first quote is, may you live in interesting times. And this is a quote theoretically from Chinese, but there's no sources. And usually it comes from the English. And I don't know about you, but I think there's too much interesting in our times right now. So keep that in mind as we move on to the second quote, which is basically something Winston Churchill said. Americans will always do the right thing only after they have tried everything else. <laughs> and the third quote comes from an article that was in the Bay City Times on Sunday. As I was trying to keep this short, I was struggling with what I would do, and then this man wrote the setups. His name is David Von Dre of the Washington Post, and here's what he wrote. When our mental bandwidth is packed with generalized gloom, there is the crisis of climate, the crisis of democracy, the crisis of gun violence, the crisis of water, and he went on for four other crises, including the crisis of a woman's right to choose. So where is the American public today? Well, on the crisis of democracy, 72% of Democrats, 60% of independents, and 49% of Republicans want to reduce big money in politics. On gerrymandering, fully transparent redistricting gets 78% from Democrats, 74% from Republicans. Public input on proposed maps gets 68% from Democrats and 63% from Republicans. Ban lobbyists from participating, 68% from Democrats, 64% from Republicans. If we move on to women's reproductive health, 69% of US adults are dissatisfied with the abortion bans. And 46% of Americans are dissatisfied and want less strict laws. If we move on to gun violence, background checks get a 87%. Red flag laws are 74%. Semi-automatic weapon bans are 55%. All of those are problems that will be changed within the five years in the future because of the mobilization of people like was seen in Wisconsin last week and in Kansas a few months ago. There is no question that the political culture of the US is going to change dramatically in the next three to five years. And that's good news for all of us. Redistricting and federal laws will come that make many good things happen. Complete government support for all health needs of women, including areas of reproduction, better than Roe. Not only will common sense laws determine who gets guns, all automatic and semi-automatic guns will be banned. And bans will be enforced about making your own guns with 3D printing. Those crises can all be solved by dramatic action on our federal and state governments. Unfortunately, this is not true for the climate issue. The climate issue five years from now will still require a lot of hard work from all of us, even if those other things come to pass. And of course, they will be helped by our work on the climate change. So it's not true because the climate issue is such a complex issue. Much progress will come, but it cannot be fast enough. The story of our future is what our two guest speakers will talk about. They will inform you from their knowledge of what's going on about how you can make your efforts 
against the climate crisis that faces us, faces us happen. So with that, I would like to bring Mary McCormick up. And Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mary. Uh, Angela Artis is the Michigan State Director for Next Gen America. She helps with encouraging youth activism and voting right here in Michigan. And she does this by promoting community and involvement through organizations that we have here. It is an honor to have her tonight, so please welcome Angela Artis. Hello. How is everyone doing this evening? I uh, would like to start off with, I am honored to be here. I am honored to be the opening act for Bill McKibben. Uh, I hope that it goes well. And if it doesn't, we have a great closer, right? <laughs> so thank you very much for being here. Now, my expertise lies in the area of organizing and mobilization, which is exactly what we need. Sorry about that. Um, so mobilization is what we're going to need to be able to fight this climate crisis. It's not going to be done by sitting in chairs and coming to things like this. It's wonderful and it's needed so people can get the message out, but we're gonna have to sit, hit the streets if we wanna see action and we wanna see change. The video you were watching earlier of Ellicott City, Maryland, I used to live three miles from where that flood happened. And I remember when the flood happened the first time, and they said it was once in a hundred years flood, and when it happened two years later, it was scary because that was one of those moments where you have that realization that everything we've been talking about is not just real, but it's here and it's now. But we have Bill McKibben to tell you much, much more about that, who is much better at it than I am. I'm gonna talk to you about Next Gen America, at least that's what I'm gonna start with. Um, so who we are is we are the largest youth mobilization political group in the country. Our focus is 18 to 35 year olds. We are largely on college campuses. We have been here at Saginaw Valley University in the past. We will hopefully be here again, especially now that I've been here and I got some friends. <laughs> All right. Um, but what we do is we talk to youth and we talk to youth in an authentic way. And one of the cool things about us is we did start with climate. That is how next, it was actually next gen climate action. And we changed over the years because the more and more we are engaging youth on the climate, it's not just the climate. The world is on fire. The world is on fire for our reproductive rights. The world is on fire for our voting rights. The world is on fire and youth want to be involved. And if you speak to youth, one, with youth, and two, in an authentic way where you're not pandering or you are not infiltrating people's wants and needs, people will take action. When you empower people, people will come together. And here's where we are right now. One of the things we're doing here in Michigan is we're going deeper and deeper because we wanna make change. And so we are no longer just looking at elections. Historically, we have come in, we have done an election, we have kicked butt and take names on college campuses and the areas surrounding college campuses, and then we've left and come back two years later. This year, we are working in the Michigan legislature on putting together bills for Promote the Vote, which passed in 2022. We are also looking at democracy issues like expansion of voting rights to those under the age of 18 in school board elections, changing our civics education so that it's active, so that you know what your county clerk does, so you know how to make a voting plan, so you know the importance of your vote, not just that we have three branches of government action. All right, so what do we do though? Like, how do we do it? Like, do I just stand around, do I talk, do I like, I don't know, go for coffee? I do, I go for a lot of coffee. <laughs> I, so I, I work with the on the ground team in the state. And um, just to give a little shout out for a second, in the front row, we have our 2022 organizing director for the state of Michigan, Ms. Rachel Deal. Could you please raise your hand? <laughs> Rachel? 
was over 18 campuses with many organizers and regional organizing directors and made sure that the vote got out in Michigan. And given a little preview, we won the lotto in the state. We got the best organizing director in the country here. And I think that shows in the fact that we had the highest youth voter turnout in the country. But that's what we do. We go into the community, we go into the colleges. So where are we at? We're at farmer's markets because this generation wants food that wasn't processed. So they're gonna go farm to table. We are going to college campuses because people are getting educated, but we're also going into neighborhoods that have high youth populations. We are also, we worked this year, we really expanded our program. We worked with returning citizens to make sure that they understood that after incarceration, they have the right to vote and they have the right to make sure that their voices are heard. We talked with youths who were aging out of the foster care system to make sure that they know that they were not going to be alone and that they did have the right to vote and they did have the right to stand up and say that things need to change because of anyone who's turning 18 in this country who knows that the system is broken, it's those that are aging out of foster care. And we worked with them this year and we will continue those relationships. All right, so, but, what can I do today? Today, um, if you didn't sign our sheet when you came in, please make sure you sign it before you leave. Get involved. We are gonna be doing Green Week calling. So you can go to our website and you can sign up for a shift to call on Green Week where we are gonna be calling our legislators, telling them to invest in green energy, to invest in the things that are gonna save our planet. And I, really implore you to register alone. So um, heading into 2024, we're gonna be organizing across Michigan. And again, come talk to me, come talk to Zach that was out front and we will get, I'd like to thank you so much for giving me this time up here. Well, that was wonderful to hear. I don't know about you guys, but I am extremely inspired to get out there now and start helping and motivating for the fight for climate change. Uh, I am Andy Clark. I'm a first year biochemistry student here. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the treasurer of the Climate Stick Club here on campus, which is really exciting and has been a great part of my freshman year. <laughs> Now, I have the great honor tonight of getting to introduce Bill, Mr. Bill McKibben. Uh, there is some information about him in your program, and it was really hard to find some things to say about him, but I did kind of settle on a few things that I really want to point out. Mr. Bill McKibben is a renowned author, a journalist, and helped to found 350.org, and he is here today representing the group that he founded, Third Act. He was awarded the Gandhi Peace Award, the Right Livelihood Award, and in 2010, he was called the nation's leading environmentalist by the Boston Globe. Pleasure. What a great, great pleasure to get to be here and to get to follow Angie. Thank you for your work and for that presentation. And what a pleasure to be here with you all. Now, I confess, I get asked to talk at a lot of places, and generally I can't come to them all. But I had somehow in my life never been to Saginaw, Michigan. So when they asked, I, and, and Madam Mayor, I will tell you, the main thing that I knew about Saginaw, Michigan before I got here was that it's where Stevie Wonder had come from. And, and I will say that is enough for any town. I mean, if you had, if you had stopped right there, that would have you produced one of the, on the very short list of the very great men who ever lived in this country. Um, um, but now, now I know that there is an awful lot more going on here, and what a pleasure to have been here, and especially at this institution, which is big and beautiful and well-constructed and filled with interesting people. I got to spend part of the afternoon with the Lifelong Learning Institute, which was great, and I got to meet a ton of the uh, regular students, uh, uh, which was just as much fun and just people doing remarkable things. So very, very good day to be a, a cardinal, if only for a little while. So uh, uh, thank you for having me. Now, now, I regret to inform you that I'm not going to be as technologically advanced as Angela. I, you know, 
people of a certain age probably shouldn't be using technology very much. And, but as it happens, I have a kind of hyper-advanced, I call it virtual PowerPoint. And if it works correctly, the pictures will kind of appear in your mind as I am talking. So <laughs> let us see if it works or not, OK? Because what I really want to talk about, I could talk about a lot of things. And, and I'll try to talk a little bit about sort of basic questions around climate change and things at some point in our fireside chat, if not before. But I was asked to talk about diversity bringing strength to climate action. And so that's really what I do want to talk about. As a small bit of background, I did, in fact, write the first book about climate change back when I, one of the, one of the odd things about old people is that once upon a time, we weren't. Um, um, and when I was in my 20s, I wrote the, the first book about what we now call climate change, what we then called the greenhouse effect. And so that sort of set my life's work. I was about as early into as it was literally possible to be, and it's where I've spent my whole life. Um, but at a certain point, and it took me too long to figure this out, 10 or 15 years, I sort of began to realize that writing more books wouldn't move the needle. I kept writing books because that's how I make my living and that's what I like to do. But I also started to switch what I did. What I'd figured out was that because I'm a writer and an academic, I sort of thought of this in terms of an argument. And when you're trying to win an argument, it's important to pile up as much evidence and data and whatever as you possibly can. And I think our theory is, well, once we've won the argument, then of course our leaders will do the right thing because why wouldn't they? It took me a while to figure out that we had won the argument, but we were still losing the climate fight because the fight wasn't actually about data and reason and evidence. The fight was about what fights are normally about, which is money and power. And the other side in this fight, the fossil fuel industry, had so much money and hence so much political power that it did not matter if they, you, the, losing the argument was not preventing them from rolling forward with their business model, even as the poles melted and the sea began to rise and on and on and on. So I decided that we better assemble some power ourselves. Uh, and lacking billions of dollars, the only other way to do that is to start trying to build movements, to try and compete in the currency of, of movements, creativity and passion and spirit, and occasionally the willingness to spend one's body perhaps and go to jail. So, so we started organizing, not that we really knew what we were doing. I wasn't trained for this the way Angie was, but and really nobody's that trained for it. We don't have like a West Point for building nonviolent movements, you know? So you sort of make it up as you go along. The we in this case was myself and seven college students at the little tiny college in rural Vermont where I hang out. And we formed this thing that we called 350.org, took its name from what the scientists said was the most carbon you could safely have in the atmosphere, 350 parts per million. A number, sadly, we're way north of now, or about 424 as of this morning. Um, that's why the Arctic melts, and it's why the oceans rise. Um, but we took that as our name because we wanted to organize around the globe, and we figured that Arabic numerals would cross those diverse linguistic boundaries more easily than English words, you know. As I say, we really didn't know what we were doing, but there were seven students, and there are seven continents, so each one took one, and the guy who took the Antarctic also had to take the internet, and we set out to find other people like ourselves around the world. Now, there's not someplace everywhere in the world someone who calls themselves an environmentalist, but there's someone everywhere who cares about public health or about women's rights or about war and peace or about development, about all the things we will not have if we keep running the temperature higher and higher until we're just in a point of constant crisis. And those were our allies. This was about 2008. And we asked them to 
organize anything. I'm a, we just told them a date in the fall of 2009 and said, organize something here to bring attention to climate change wherever you are. I'm a, I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher, so the Methodist um, sacrament is pretty much the potluck supper, you know, and this was pretty much just the potluck supper approach. Here's the date, and you figure out what to do, you know. And people responded all over the world when we had that day of action. Well, let me tell you about the, the week of it, because it really brings this diversity question right to the fore. We had our, we're getting ready to have this big day of action. We told everybody to do their thing on a Saturday. And on Thursday, we were sitting around our office and the satellite phone rang. And it was our leader in Ethiopia, who like, most of us was a she, and like a surprising number of us was 17 years old, um, and she was in tears on the phone. And she said, they've taken away our permit for Saturday, um, but we're going to try and do this today before they can stop us, which was a brave thing to do. It's not the nicest government in the world, um, but that wasn't why she was crying. She kept saying, we wanted to do this the same day as everybody else. We wanted to do it same time. We want to be part of the whole thing. We're really, we hope we're not spoiling it. We're really sorry. And we have 10,000 young people out in the street right now chanting 350 in Addis Ababa. And I was like, wow, do not worry about the date. That's not a problem. Um, good work. What we need from you, and remember, this, we're going to tell you, story because it, it's real and I want you to understand always be understanding what the world is like I said we need a picture of that so that we can show it to reporters all over the world and get them excited and stuff and she says well the internet's not really working today um, here in Ethiopia I was like, oh. um, and so I looked up on my computer to see if there was a Western hotel in Addis Ababa, and there was one, the Intercontinental. I said, I know that there's got to be internet in the lobby there in the Intercontinental. Go there and, you know, walk in and use it and send us a picture. I got a call back about 20 minutes later. She's like, I'm at the Intercontinental, but they won't let me in. They don't let, uh, you know, they don't let locals, they don't really let black people into the Intercontinental. And I was like, okay, this is getting way too real here. Um, um, and I've said, look around. I'm sorry. I said, look around and see if you can't find some nice white lady who's walking in the hotel and hand her your phone and tell her to press the button when she gets inside. And that's just what she did. And we got the picture 20 minutes later, and it was beautiful. 10,000 kids out, banners and things all in the street in Addis Ababa. And we sent it around the world, and it went everywhere. And it was one of the things that really helped spark that weekend. But just think for a minute about all the kind of things that are wrapped up in that one little story about privilege and about ability to connect with the rest of the world and about who's good organizers and on and on and on. Well, it was a good omen for us because over that weekend, there were 5,100 demonstrations in 181 countries. CNN called it the most widespread day of political activity in the planet's history. And there was one right here in Saginaw, and I'm really grateful to Pat for that and for much else. He's a tremendous organizer, as many of you know. But we told everybody to upload pictures of those demonstrations as they were happening. Facebook and Twitter weren't really things yet, but there was our killer app was something called Flickr that let you upload pictures. So, and I, my job was to take those pictures. They were coming in and send them out all over the place again and things. And they were coming in 20 or 30 a minute there for a while, really for most of the weekend. And it was amazing watching them because it taught me continued to teach me a powerful lesson that the story from Ethiopia had begun to teach me. I had always been told that environmentalists were rich white people. And if you did not know where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist because you'd have more important things on your mind and on and on and on. 
It took about 20 minutes of watching those pictures come in to recognize that almost everybody we were working with around the world was poor and black and brown and Asian and young. Because that's what almost all the world is, you know. And what do you know? Exactly as interested in the future as I was, maybe even more so, because the future bears down hard on you if you're in some of those places. The iron law of climate change is the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you get hit. Look, for instance, at what happened in Pakistan last fall. One of the properties of a warmer air is that it can hold more water vapor, which allows us to have floods on a scale we've never seen before. Well, the biggest of them all was what happened in uh, September, August and September in Pakistan last year. It was the biggest flood since Noah. Um, um, just started raining and didn't stop for day after day after weeks. There were towns in the provinces of Sindh and Balochistan that got 800% of their annual rainfall in the course of three weeks. Okay. Um, so there's no place on earth that can cope with that. Uh, you know, people had lived, most, most houses over there are of mud construction, which works great. People have lived happily in them for a long time. But if it rains, it pours nonstop. For, people's houses just melted around them. You know? By the time it was all done, 33 million people had been displaced. And that's the entire population of, from Boston down to Baltimore having to leave their homes. You know? um, the 200 million people who live in Pakistan have put way less than 1% of the carbon that's currently in the atmosphere in the atmosphere. The 300 million people who live in this country have put about 25% of all the CO2 in the atmosphere in the atmosphere. Not Pakistan's fault, not Sudan and Somalia's fault that they've gone the last five rainy seasons without any rain. It's because the temperature now in the uh, surrounding oceans is so high that it's changed the way that weather works in that part of the world and the rain is no longer falling on those places and there are now tens of millions of people dependent at best on a little food aid from the UN to somehow get them through the day. The average Sudanese has produced one five hundredth as much carbon in their lifetime as the average American, so not their fault. Um, and that confers, obviously, an obligation on all of us to do the right thing. But it also confers real moral power on the rest of the world to demand that we do the right thing. And that diversity, when we can bring it together in the form of organizing the whole globe, is a very special thing when it happens. And it happened that day, and it's happened some days since. We think we've organized around 20,000 demonstrations in every country on Earth except North Korea in the years since. And it's been beautiful, beautiful to watch. And the leadership comes always from frontline communities, the places that are most vulnerable. Think about the incredible environmental leadership that the people of Flint have shown in this state, for instance, okay? And the leadership, the leadership comes always everywhere around the world from indigenous communities. Think about the leadership that indigenous communities in the upper Midwest have shown in the fights over Line 5 and Line 3 pipelines. You know? Because, as you would expect, people's lives are on the line. That concentrates the mind, you know? Um, um, it turns you into a fighter if you were not one before because your survival depends on it. It's no surprise that when we pull people in this country, it's black Americans and Latino Americans who are by far the most concerned about climate change. The numbers are off the charts. It turns out truthfully, remember what I told you about how I've always been told that environmentalism was something that rich white people did? It turns out really that um, 
pouring carbon into the air is something that rich white people do. Um, um, and, and so we have to build a powerful, powerful, diverse environmental movement, which we've begun to do, I think, in significant and important ways. And I'm going to talk about one of the other axes of diversity that maybe we haven't thought about quite as much until Angie's terrific um, uh, presentation. Because the other group that's been really good on climate change is young people. And again, for pretty obvious reasons, you know, I'm going to be dead before the very worst of all of this kicks in. But if you are a student here right now, it does not matter what class you're taking. If we don't get this right pretty soon, your job when you're my age is going to be disaster response because that's going to be everybody's job. Okay? And so it, again, concentrates the mind. And it is no wonder that it was young people who, except for me, started 350.org and you know, we ran this big, continue to run this big campaign around the world to get uh, institutions to divest their holdings in fossil fuel. And young people have run that. It's become the biggest anti-corporate, we're about $40 trillion now in endowments and portfolios that have divested from fossil fuel. And that's Harvard and, um, Harvard and Princeton and Oxford and Cambridge but it's also a thousand other schools, including uh, the University of Michigan, um, um, which did it fairly early on. And that was a very big deal in that campaign for which we're grateful. Um, but it was young people who did that work. And when young people got out of, when they, when they graduated, as is their want, um, um, when they got out, they wanted to keep working, so they formed something called the Sunrise Movement, these kids who had done divestment. And it was the Sunrise Movement that brought us the Green New Deal, and it was the Green New Deal that got us this IRA bill last year, because they'd laid the groundwork for it and demanded it and pushed for it. It came, as everything that goes through Congress does, came out somewhat misshapen on the other end, but at least there was something there to start with. And of course, there were lots of other young people doing amazing things all over the world. You all know about Greta Thunberg, and you should. And she's one of, I adore her. She's one of my favorite people to work with in the whole world. And I, I always enjoy talking with her and working with her. But she would be the first person to tell you that there are 10,000 Greta Thunbergs around this planet. And I met a couple of them at dinner tonight. Um, remarkable young people leading the cause, and they have behind them there were 10 million kids out on school strike in September of 2019 for action on climate before the pandemic kind of shut things down for a while. So young people are doing a great job and as well they should. But I began to get a little tired as I was telling these lifelong learning people earlier today. I began to get a little tired at a certain point of people explaining to me that it was up to the next generation to solve this problem. That seems highly unfair, and it also seems somewhat impractical, because young people have all the energy, all the intelligence, all the idealism, but they lack by themselves the structural power to make the change that we need to make in the time that we have. Okay? So, this is a fun, as Angie said, this is a fun audience because it's pretty, pretty perfectly divided between two age demographics, you know. And it's the other age demographic that I want to talk to for a minute, okay? Because the people who have a lot of structural power are people with hairlines like mine, okay? Um, if you're over the age of 60, there are 70 million of us in this country. And multiply that by some factor, because nobody has to encourage us to get out and vote. We, there is no known way to prevent old people from voting. Uh, uh, young people should be well aware of that. You better get out and vote, because you can be darn certain that everybody who looks like me is going to be out voting. So make sure you're too. Not only that, we ended up with most of the money. Um, the baby boomers and the silent generation above them have 70% of the country's financial assets. 
So we should be a powerful tool if we can mobilize. People have said it won't, can't work because people become more conservative as they age. Maybe a little true, you know, definitely get crotchetier as you age, you know. <laughs> um, but look, if you're in your what we're calling third act, that's this new organization we've formed about a year ago. If you're over 60, if you're in your third act now, your first act was back in that moment of epic cultural, social, political transformation when the world changed, when we started taking women to be serious parts of public life, when the apex of the civil rights movement, the first Earth Day, on and on and on. I was telling people earlier today, if you have any doubts about this, look at what the Supreme Court went after when they went on their rampage last summer. They went after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Gun Control Act of 1968, the Clean Air Act of 1970, and Roe v. Wade 1973. That's what they're trying to undo, okay? It was the stuff that we did when we were young and that we should now figure out how to defend. Defend in really straightforward ways. So that's what we've been doing. The third act we started a year ago, it's grown very, very fast. There's now tens of thousands of people around the country engaged in it. They've set up chapters and working groups and stuff, hither and yon. Um, they're, because among other things, one other thing old people have is some time that they might not have had before. And they have a lot of skills about how to put it to good use and things. So people have been doing all that, and it's been beautiful to watch. We kind of had our first big day of action just two weeks ago, and I'm going to tell you about it. We'd done a lot of organizing work around the elections and stuff a year ago, but the elections for the moment were in that brief, like, three-month period when they allow us not to be in the middle of an election anymore. And so we used the time to go after... Um, uh, the, the, to go after the fossil fuel industry, in particular to go after the four big American banks, Chase, City, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, that are the four biggest funders of the fossil fuel industry. They've given them more than a trillion dollars since we signed the Paris Climate Accords. They did not need Donald Trump to sabotage the Paris Climate Accords. Big banks were happy to do it by themselves for a percentage. And so we wanted to try and start bringing that to people's attention. So we had a big day of action all over the country. We had 100 demonstrations hither and yon, and they were beautiful and powerful. Um, you know, up in Alaska, they made big credit cards out of wood and then cut them up with solar-powered chainsaws, you know. And, uh, I was in Washington, D.C., where first thing to be said was the diversity of the new environmental movement was on display. The big rally we had, the speakers besides me were a woman named Ebony Martin, who's just taken over as the head of Greenpeace, the first African-American to run that important institution. And she was followed directly by an old friend of mine, Ben Jealous, who's just taken over and uh, taken over the Sierra Club, our biggest environmental organization, but who used to run the NAACP, and that marriage of the civil rights movement and the environmental movement is going to be a powerful, powerful thing, I would predict. So that was good. That diversity was on display. And then, then we leaned into the fact of being old. You know. We did a, um, a sit-in that shut down these four banks for the day. They just locked up. But we did the sit-in in rocking chairs in front of each one. And it was by far the most comfortable. I've taken part in my, more than my share of sit-ins. This was the first comfortable one ever, and that's the only way I'm doing it from now on, I tell you. Um, um, and it was just beautiful to get to see people standing up for each other. Um, generations working together in the ways that we need to work. I was telling people before that my least favorite bumper sticker in the whole world is the one you see sometimes on the back of people's Winnebago's or something. And it says, I'm spending my kid's inheritance. It's like, ha, 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 you know. Um, it's basically true in 
every sense of the word. That's what has been happening, and it's what has to stop. And people want it to stop, I think. I think when older people now start to think about their legacy, which, if you're 20, properly seems like a very abstract notion, doesn't seem quite so abstract when you find yourself nearer the exit than the entrance, you know? Um, your legacy is the world you leave behind for the people you love the most. And we're in danger of leaving behind a world that was worse than the one we found. Um, and, and so we were doing our best to bring what we could. That's what this fight is going to take. And the diversity is absolutely crucial to making it happen. So I am very grateful that you picked this topic for us tonight. I think it was just the right topic. And I thank you so much for doing it and for letting us be here. What a pleasure. Thank you. We're here at Saginaw Valley, um, and I'm the president of the Climate Stick Club here at Saginaw Valley. So, um, <laughs> and Pat here is the founder of the lovely uh, organization that we call home, and we will be facilitating this fireside chat with Angela and Bill tonight. We have the opportunity to ask them a few questions, hopefully ones that you were wondering as well. So, organization. So Emma has the first question, and uh, believe me, it's quite a question. Um, so, you know, climate activism has been a generational movement, um, but over time it seems that we've only made very small, um, small improvements. Um, but so given you, that you, Angela, work with the younger generation and that you, Bill, work with the older generation, uh, is there anything that you've seen in your endeavors that you would consider to be uh, like a light at the end of the tunnel for uh, climate change or not? Okay. So so it takes both these things. It takes that science and engineering, and then it takes that political organizing to give, you know, to, to allow it to, 50 years from now, do not get me wrong, we're gonna run the planet on sun and wind because it's gonna be close to free. But if it takes us anything like 50 years to get there, then the planet we run on sun and wind will be a broken planet. Climate change, the essential physical fact of it is, it's a timed test. Winning slowly is just a different way of losing on climate change. It's not like other political issues. As long as we've been alive, for instance, we've been debating, should we have national health care in America? I think it's a sin and a shame that we do not. I assume that eventually we'll join every other industrialized nation in having it. People will die and go bankrupt in the meantime, but it will not be harder to do it when we finally make up our minds to do it, you know? Climate change is not like that. Once you've melted the Arctic, nobody has a good plan for how you freeze it back up again, okay? And we've melted more than half of it already. So time is very short. That's why the urgency that, that, that Angie and I were both kind of projecting here, I think. And that's really what that climate stick demonstrates so powerfully, you know, just how little margin we have left. And for me, I think it's that we have a generation that actually sees that urgency in a way that generations that came before didn't. And Go ahead. All right. Okay, so my next question is, um, if diversity brings strength to climate action, uh, what would you two consider to be the biggest weakness in climate action? And uh, what would be the best way for you to suggest turning that, that weakness into a strength? I think, you know, and Bill talked about it, the, the biggest thing that is working against climate action is the money that's involved with destroying the planet. That is the biggest hurdle that we have to overcome in climate action. And the only way you do that is by organizing. That is, that's it, plain and simple. That's exactly right. There's no use wishing it away. And, you know, people always, we should get money out of politics. And we sure should, you know. I'm a Vermonter. Bernie's an old friend of mine, you know. Uh, he's, he's absolutely right about that. Citizens United was a disgrace. But it's not going to go away on its own. Um, and the only, way to, the only way to do any of this stuff is to organize. Now, 
The 20th century gave us two, it's gonna turn out when historians think about it, two great technologies. One of them was the solar panel, and the other is the nonviolent social movement, which was a technology invented on the margins, Gandhi and the suffragists and Dr. King, um, um, whose birthday we celebrate because Stevie Wonder made us celebrate his birthday, one of the great political organizing victories of all time. Um, um, they invented this technology that allowed the small and the many to stand up to the mighty and the few. But it takes a lot of work. Occasionally that work is dramatic, you know, uh, civil disobedience. Usually it's Facebooking and petition signing and phone banking and on and on and on. It's all work, but it's all beautiful, joyful work if it's done in the right spirit and with the right, you know, with a really diverse and beautiful group of people, which like the one we have tonight. And one of the things I really lo love to talk to people and encourage them, I talked to it a little bit on stage, find something locally. Because one of the things that gets that spirit and that joy is victory. And you can make a change locally. So Angela, my next question comes out of my organizing background. I want you to tell the young people in this audience, what are the three things that they should do tomorrow or next week that moves them towards supporting you in the Next Gen America's activity? First thing you do, did you sign, sign those sheets? Board. Did you sign those sheets? If you didn't sign those sheets, make sure you sign those. Next week, we have go to nextgen.com and you can sign up on our Mobilize to be able to talk to your local politicians about climate friendly legislation. And third, when I call or text you, answer. So for Bill, uh, it's a little more complicated question. So the question to you is, when you know all of that, and you know what the challenge really is for us to get through the next six years, how do you deal with that? I mean, I've seen 2,100 people clap for you when you got the award in Ann Arbor, okay? And so there's a great deal of positive response you get, but you probably know more than most of us how difficult it's gonna to be to get through to the other side. How do you deal with that? Well, um, in certain ways, um, climate, uh, look, climate is a fraught issue. We're talking about the most, the scariest thing that our species has ever managed to do. Um, and especially if you have kids or grandkids, it's or young people that you love. It really is emotionally scary sometimes. Maybe a little easier for me because I've had such a long time to deal with it, more or less my whole life. And so I've worked through some of the emotion and because I've had the great outlet of being able to organize, which is the only antidote, I think, to that kind of anxiety and despair. Um, but I'm also a writer. So part of my way of dealing with this is to constantly be on the lookout for new images, new ways of thinking about this that help other people through it. The one that really captivates my mind at the moment, that builds on what I was saying about these stark and remarkable decreases in the cost of renewable energy, is that, and for me anyway, this is very exciting, that humans are right at the edge of being able to end our 700,000-year-old habit of setting things on fire. Um, worked well for us. You know, when we learned to make fire, we were able to cook food and we got the big brain as a result. We could move north and south from the equator. The anthropologists say that some of the social bonds of our species come from all those nights around the campfire. Um, when we learned to control the combustion of coal and gas and oil, it made us rich and got us modernity with the Industrial Revolution. But now it comes at a big cost. Uh, 
not only the existential risk of climate change, but also the nine million deaths a year, one death in five on our planet that comes from people breathing the particulates that are produced when we burn stuff. And third, the very large cost of the fact that as long as we depend on a resource that's only available in a few places, the people who live on top of those places will have way more power than they should, think Vladimir Putin, um, um, able to invade Ukraine entirely because of the wealth he's gained from uh, oil and gas. Uh, so to me, it's extremely exciting that we're now at the moment, this may, be, this may be the Methodist Sunday school teacher in me, uh, when we can take full advantage of the fact that the good Lord was kind enough to hang a large ball of burning gas 93 million miles away. We can power, we, we can catch its rays on a sheet of glass. We can take advantage of the fact that it differentially heats the earth and produces the wind that drives those gorgeous turbines as they turn. Um, um, that's Hogwarts scale magic, you know? And if we were smart, we would take, that would be the thing that we would be absolutely concentrated, fixated on, on this planet right now, is figuring out just how fast we can spread that as far and wide as possible, because then we would be in a, then we'd be in a world where people would need to be getting asthma. Then we'd be in a world where nobody would have to bow a knee to Putin or the king of Saudi Arabia or the Koch brothers who are our biggest oil and gas barons. Then we'd be in a world where, you know, 20 year olds would not be wondering whether it's okay for them to have kids or not because what kind of world are they going to live in? It's not like the world that run on sun and wind would be a utopia. I doubt we're ever gonna have a utopia. There'll be different problems, they'll come with them, but they won't be those problems and they won't be on the scale of those problems because this is the biggest problem that we've ever come up against and by a large margin. Well, hi everyone, I'm Deva Patel and I just wanna thank you all so much for coming to this event. I also wanted to take a moment to thank the sponsors of this event. That would be the Dow Visiting Scholars and Artists Series here at SVSU, SVSU's Office of Diversity Programs, Academic Affairs, and the College of Science, Engineering, and Technology. I also wanna give a huge thank you to the SVSU Climate Stick Club and Pat Race for organizing this event. And lastly, to our two speakers, Bill and Angela. I really hope that you all take the information that we learned today and become active citizens in combating climate change and really to bring diversity to the cause. So thank you all so much for coming and I hope you all have a great evening. Very good work. All right. Such good work.